say something. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Ah, okay. So even the recording has start has started. So I'll just go straight to the to the tutorial. Today we have an exciting tutorial. And I don't know if some of you have gone through the Tuesday folder, if you have gone through the tutorial schedule. Do we know why we are here today, this afternoon? Evening to some of us. Do we know why we're having this tutorial? What is it we expect to learn from this tutorial? You can just raise your hands or maybe communicate on the chat. Okay, so whenever the silence, we tend to assume that you don't know anyone, so all uh, 60 of us. So, yeah, the something better visualization. I don't know if the sub is the only one who has been through the document. Okay, so silence I'll just introduce to learn about EDA and libraries. Yes, just yes, you want something, you have something to say. Just yes. Yeah. Hey, good morning. Yes. Good morning. I, what I what I wanted to say is that we are expecting to learn explanatory data. We we are we are expecting to learn how to analyze uh, the data using the the Python libraries. Okay. So some are close, but not exactly. So to just uh, summarize. Uh, what we'll be doing mainly is going through a few Python libraries that uh, we'll be using a lot in um, from week zero all the way to week twelve. And um, uh, in addition to that, we'll also do something called exploratory data analysis. So unlike the ana analysis that you expect, when you say exploratory data analysis, just from the word exploratory, it's just to understand our data. I'll do the paper libraries and maybe just to ask, has anyone here maybe interpreted the Python libraries? Do we know what Python libraries are? Why do we need them? Anyone? Guys, let's make the session interactive. Do we know what Python libraries are and why we need them? Yes, just yes again. Justice, are you there? Can I go ahead and give it to Sene? Okay. Sene will be. Yes, I don't know if you can hear me now. Is there a yes, question can. about specific libraries or just what the libraries are in general? Okay, so Sene, let Jusius just go. It's a question just on what Python libraries are, if you've used them, and why do you think, why do we need them? So let's just do Jusius, then Sene, you'll go next. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I think they are uh, some, they are a set of methods that are available in, in Python and that we can use. For instance, if I would like to use a method which is not implemented uh, uh, in Python, I can download a, a library that have uh, that methods, and then I can use the method through the library. The, the library. That's what I can say. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that, Jesus. Do you have something to add, Seni? To that, Seni. All the Gabriel. Uh, libraries are basically pre-written code that solve most of the problems that we might face. It could be for writing servers or uh, doing machine learning or etc. For example, in uh, our current project, we use pandas and another one I forgot the name. So that's me. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that, Seni. Adijat, Adijat, you wanna go next? Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm going to go with uh, how who I'm um, so I hope I pronounced that well. So it's they, they are creating codes, right? But they, they are a form of abstraction when we abstract some every work to 
some some sort of some sort of functions so that we just pull them and use them pull them and use them it works just like every other library in programming okay okay thank you for that i did that maurice you want to wrap up before i continue yeah uh, thank you uh, can you hear me yes i can hear you okay uh, for me library is a kind of uh, let's say uh, a code that already designed in a pack in some of uh, a package that you can call in your python environment to do a kind of analysis like uh, you can use a pandas to look at the data frame to do some statistical basic analysis you can use a matplotlib for plotting the chart so to look at your data how it behave so it's what i can add for that for that thank you okay thank you maurice for that so from what uh, all the all of i think we've had about four or five uh, contributions uh we are all collect correct and something i would like to emphasize is that when we are working with code there's always that uh option of starting everything from scratch and uh, you want to deal with data frames and you can start everything from scratch not using anything but libraries come in to help because it's something already predefined a code that somebody else contributed before and it's um as a digit say it helps with that form of abstraction they've done it you can use it to do something else and then build up on it so they're there to just um some work is just repetitive and in object-oriented programming we we don't do a lot of repetitive work so if there's a library that can do that for you we just can use that library build on from there and continue with your code so with that said i hope you've all understood why we need python libraries i'll go through three main libraries you'll find that each library was developed for something specific like uh i think it was um Sene who talked about pandas and this library specifically is used to interact with data frames just how do you communicate with the data frames how do you read it maybe saving just something to so basically pandas is all about data frame we also have and we'll be looking at pandas and just a little bit about pandas we also have uh, i think there was someone i don't remember the name who said about visualizations and uh that could actually be an entire library on its own somebody just developed a lot of code on visualizing data on visualizing data and for today we'll be going through a python library called matplotlib which is mainly used for this visualizations kind of task there are others i'll we'll just go through three main pandas matplotlib and then finally a scalar something very important actually when you're doing machine learning and uh, just a lot of modeling so these three are not the only python libraries we have in um in python but we'll just go through these three because they are main and uh we'll be using them a lot so directly to the tutorial if you have any question you can just raise your hand if i don't see your hand because i'm um, maneuvering from pages you can just cut me off kind of kindly and uh go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so to start with the Python um, libraries, as I said, we'll be going through pandas, matplotlib, and uh, sklearn. We'll touch a little bit on the others, but I just want us to focus on these three libraries. And um, I got a question. Oh, okay, sorry. And uh, so up to now, I think uh, what we keep emphasizing is if you're doing anything modeling, if you're doing anything to do with machine learning, data data is important. And this week we'll be using Twitter data, but for this specific um, library, especially the pandas, I've decided to go ahead and uh, use a totally different kind of data. And uh, then God, it's a, in, uh, in the Python world, data sets these days are all over the place and you can't miss data. Even through this tutorial, we'll go through a multiple kind of data, simple data, and uh, just uh, big data. So for this example, though we don't need to see where, how I took the data, but this is basically just, um, sorry, don't run. Yeah. Okay, so this is basically just um, 
like uh, movie rating data. I got this from IMDB and I just wanted to see how we can uh, understand data using pandas specifically. So that's why I have this example data. This is a movie, a movie ratings, movie reviews kind of data. So this is not important for our, for our tutorial today, but that's the kind of data that we'll be using. So when we say libraries, and we've just said that these are things already uh, predefined by others, if you want to use it in your code, there is this thing we called imports. And if you want to use pandas all the time, you have to import pandas. If you want to use maybe the matplotlib, as we'll see later, you'll have to import matplotlib because you need all that code, the abstracted code, to come to your environment, then you can use it within your environment. That's why we do imports. From the fixing bugs we give you, you'll find that maybe, because I've seen someone ask, uh, why do I get this error? And most of the time, it's maybe a module import error or uh, like, for example, this PD, maybe you're using it in your code, but it's not yet imported. So that is why we do imports. It's somebody else code abstracted somewhere and you just need to bring it to your environment so that you can make use of it. So that's why we have this section on imports. I've imported a lot, a lot of libraries. We'll see most of them, not all of them. We'll just look at uh, most of them during this tutorial. So I hope you understand what and why we do imports for our code. So straight on to pandas. And as I had said, pandas, uh, they help us a lot with uh, data processing. And just how do you query that data? How maybe do you analyze that data? When it comes to understanding data, it uh, comes maybe understanding is the structure, the information in that data, We what we call the um, metadata, just additional things that don't come with the data as you see it. So pandas will help us to visualize this. So again, if you wanna go through with me, this, this specific notebook is in the week zero folder. So if you feel like you wanna go through it, it's in the week zero folder. Okay, so read the week zero folder. Week zero on Tuesday, Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday. Yeah, so this Python libraries is the notebook that I am going through at the moment. If you wanna follow through, you can just use that one. So to look at uh, pandas and some of the power it can have, I won't look at everything in pandas, there's a lot to pandas, but just a little bit that uh, we may need. I've, uh, for this specific how, how to use pandas, I've created a function. I hope we all know what functions uh, are. Uh, that is uh, programming in just like any language a function, they mean the same thing. So you'll find that in this function, anywhere I use maybe PD, if you find, for example, where do I have a PD? Mm -hmm. Okay, like here, for example, I was returning a, a data frame. And since I was returning a data frame from this from this uh, function, I've said if you want to interact with data frames, the best ability to use is the pandas. And that's why we have here. So what, what I'm just doing here, this is a little bit small. You don't have to know everything going on here. But the data that I downloaded from from the I from IMDB, the movie reviews, I'm just taking that data. Most of the time, you know, it comes in an unorganized way. And uh, so what I'm just doing here is from that data that I have mined from a specific site, I just take it through a number of processes, maybe just to get that files, appending files to make them in a sort of understandable way, a data frame way, going into specific files to get this and that data. And then in the end, what we want is this, pandas data frame, one with just uh, text and label. Why am I going for text and label? Of course, the data has a lot of information, but I was going for text and label because if we are doing a modeling kind of kind of uh, project, uh, for those who have done machine learning, you know that these are the main important things in a labeled kind of data and uh let's call it so um, yeah in a label data so we have our x features which i'm using as text and then we have our label 
so for this specific data our this was a kind of like lecture data we have and uh, we were trying this data was giving the the sentiment going on like is it a positive kind of review or is it a negative kind of review so our labels are in just two formats zero and one and what you'll notice i've done with pandas again since here i've said that my output is a uh, pandas data frame anything else i do to this output is a uh, functionality given to us by pandas so for example after creating this data frame you'll notice that i am saving it to csv this to csv is a method i think josias had mentioned things about methods this is a method that ha is given to us by pandas so luckily i'm using google collab i don't know if most of you are um, are aware of this platform and when i click this parameter given to us by pandas i can see who developed when they developed this module what kind of definition did they give to this module and uh so when i click this whatever you're seeing here is um uh, just the definition of this specific method that somebody did in pandas we don't need to know this maybe just something sometimes you you, you call it to csv and like you see here we've called index and the fact that you are calling here index is because whoever um did the definition of this method let me just see there's something they did an argument called uh, index so i can't see it here but uh, there should be an argument call here i think yes i don't know if you can see guys but there's an argument here call index so if you've uh, interacted with functions you know when you are when you're calling a function you can call a specific argument and give it a parameter like this index here it can take two values it can take a bold, which is either true or false. So it has been given true, meaning if you don't, if you don't uh, exclusively say false, it will just take true. So I'm explaining functions, and I just hope that you guys know how functions work. Something else we did, we did here to CSV, and we also did here read CSV. This is another function that comes with the pandas. Um, with the pandas library and again just like the two csv it has already been defined and you just use that which that which helps you so again so i'm just going through a few of the functions you'll be finding you'll find yourself using a lot especially to explore data and the other function you'll get is this function called head and what head does in um in pandas is just to give you a sample of your data and when we say head most of the time as you can see here it's been uh, initialized to five it's been initialized to five so when i say 10 here i'm actually giving explicitly my parameter to have 10 as the number of rows i want to see but as you can see originally it's usually just five so again a few of the things i don't know if I'm, I'm, i've done anything else so we're still doing a head or oh, yeah there's something here it's called lock Apart from the head, let me just go to the, the header I was going to take you through. Apart from the head, you'll also find that it gives other, other functions like drop and A, which is now drop null. Then go again to Google Collab. I can actually see what uh, drop null does. We also have other, we also have other, other functions like is null. All these are given by pandas. We have other functions like I think info. Info just gives you the metadata I was talking about on your data frame, and uh, it gives you from your data what the name of your columns is. Does that does it have any non values? Maybe the count of those non values and the data type of that column. So this is just um, an overview of what pandas. Some of the things that pandas gives us. So before I go on to the next part, which I think is important, especially for what we'll be doing also within Pandas, if you have access or if you've gotten access to this notebook, you'll notice there are links up here. So if you want to go ahead and uh, learn more about Pandas, you can just use these tutorials, especially the introduction tutorials. You can just use that those tutorials to understand more about Pandas, how they can help you. Is someone talking? Does someone want to say something? Wow. Okay. So does someone want to say something? I had. Okay. So to finish up, to finish up on pandas, 
let me just finish up on pandas is uh, another very helpful method called lock and uh, i lock so i'm just just wanted to show the difference between lock and i lock because this lock and i lock functions uh, help us in an entire data frame maybe a data frame of 1 million rows using lock and i lock we can specifically access uh, a number of rows maybe just one or a number of them so just to look at these two functions explicitly here i've created now just another data this is dummy data from the beginning we're using the movie review data but here i'm just using a dummy data and i'm using it as a series and not a data frame so just i created the dummy data and then using lock lock the difference between lock and i lock because i know most people tend to have conflict here is that lock helps you to access an index with that specific label so for example from this dummy data you can see that i have um i have my label here and i have the content so like label 49 is a like for example if you want to say um, if your data your, your data is indexed as a b c d e f maybe a stands for i have no idea where I have no idea is maybe a text. Maybe index C stands for something else. Again, where something else is another, another content. So when we say lock, we are accessing the label's name. So like, for example, here, when I say zero, we will be accessing this data with a label zero. And that's why our output is D. And when I do I lock with the same number again, zero, this is accessing now the, the index location. If you've done programming before, you know that uh, indexing in programming starts from zero and not from one. And that's why when I say I lock zero, it takes the first, the first position, which is now this being our first position, our value is A. So I hope you've understood the difference between lock and I lock. When you're using lock, it's specifically to get a label that you know. Like for example, if I just change here to two, this is a label called two. I expect my output to be F and um, mm -hmm, just a minute, I don't know why it's taking so long. Okay, so with lock and uh, using two as our value, we are expecting um, an index with the label two, which is F. F is what we are expecting here. But if I come here and say again, I lock and give it to, we'll be taking uh, the third position, which again, since it's two, we've started from zero, one, two. Again, basic programming. So for this second value, we'll be expecting C. So I don't know why it's taking so long. Let me just do this again. Let me click the series again. Okay, so sorry about that. I think this uh, delay, I don't know from where I see like um, I have enough RAM, I have enough disk, so I don't know why it's taking so long, but trust me guys, that's what it means. <laughs> okay, so I'll be going next to Matplotlib. I don't know if there's any question on pandas. We don't have so much time. I don't know if there's any question on pandas so far because I want you to go next to Matplotlib, another library. Okay, silence means we have all understood. That's what I'll just be inferring from now. And uh, when we go to Matplotlib, as I had said, Matplotlib is uh, mainly used for visualizations. And I won't go deeper into Matplotlib and visualizations. I'll just do a simple comparison. You've understood what libraries are from the way I have explained um, pandas. So I won't go into the nitty gritty of Matplotlib. But as I've said, matplotlib, it's as simple as import matplotlib. Again, use uh, matplotlib. So when I just do this, when, when if I'm using PLTs, because as I have aliased it, I hope you understand that. For pandas, it's mainly aliased as PD. For matplotlib, 
we take it as PLT. That's why I'm using PLT and not the full name matplotlib. So when you want to plot anything in matplotlib, it's as simple as uh, the Python library. Then you use plot and you give it and you give it your values. So I did create values as well here, just a cosine and a sine of uh, numbers uh, in the range of just 256. So this is just creating data and getting the cosine and the sine. And just to plot, for example, just using matplotlib the library and using the word plot, immediately you get a plot. And uh, this is displayed by plt.show. Again, just take note of the methods. Show is a method. So again, it's as simple as that, but matplotlib can get really, it can get really detailed and uh, into getting something specific that you want. So when I just did show, it it gives us its base, its baseline, the colors it chose, the grade it chose, everything that you see here is matplotlib that has just been predefined. But we can go ahead and maybe change a few things, maybe what the size of our figure, maybe these lines that you're seeing here, what is the width, maybe the colors. You can see here the colors we have blue and orange, so matplotlib allows to change colors, the style, Apart from a line, we also have other things. We have 3D figures, we have uh, bar graphs, we have pie charts, all kind of charts you learned in school. In school, Matplotlib can give you that. We also, you can change the axis, so many things. So just to summarize it all, from these three lines of code and this output, we can change that and have an entire line of code that is basically specific to what we want. And here, if you go through this code, you just notice a few things. I am changing the figure size to 85. I am change, I am using subplots. Again, I'm changing the spines, these uh, lines that we are using here. I'm changing them, giving them different colors, setting the positions of ticks. So many things are going. I've done them in one in one code so that you can just understand how big matplotlib can actually expand. We can set the line width of our lines, we can set the style, maybe use dash, pull what we can give it a label, we can get X sticks, so many things. You can't understand just uh, how far matplotlib can go. This code is just simple. And uh, from our simple graph, line graph that we saw here, we can do all that and shift from that all the way to this kind of output. So this is a better looking graph, of course, if you're doing mathematics and you wanted to show this kind of outputs, this looks much better and matplotlib has the power to get you to this by just understanding again the different methods already predefined and you can see here we changed the color we changed the width we've added a different kind of line here we've do we've done labels this thing their labels you can see the ticks have been named differently there's another legend here and so many things we even have a function for save the figure so this figure i've actually already saved it so I hope again, because I won't go deeper into matplotlib. There's so much to matplotlib. If you want to understand matplotlib in details, again, there's another tutorial that has been added here. And this tutorial is very detailed into what you can use with matplotlib, how. So if you just think I want to do a visualization, go to this tutorial and just there, readme is very detailed. Everything you want to learn about uh, matplotlib, this can give you. And I was saying the uh, different types of figures you can get. It also lists here what figures you can get and um, how you can get to that. So just to scroll through, you see we have a regular plot, which is basically a line plot. We have scatter plots, we have bar plots, we have contour plots, we have so many things. I don't, other things I've not even interacted with myself but matplotlib is basically massive and any visualization you want, you can use with matplotlib. So in addition to this library, I've included here Seaborn, which again can also be used for visualization. So whatever you are thinking about, so if it is not in matplotlib, consider looking at Seaborn. So up to there, any questions on those two libraries, matplotlib and, um, and pandas? Again, are we still together? Am I talking alone? Are you guys still there? Any confirmation? Do someone want to say anything or uh, type anything? Yes, Prince. 
Okay, Prince, thank you for just confirming. Oh, and Rediet, thank you. So finally, our last, our last uh, Python library that I want us to go through is sklearn. And sklearn will mainly be used, you'll use sklearn for, if, okay, most things machine learning. Instead of starting from the beginning in, uh, in machine learning and modeling, we go through specific specific steps that are just repetitive. You'll find that maybe you, you get the data, and these days this is an entire career on its own called data engineering. You get the data, you understand the data, exploratory data analysis, maybe you visualize a little bit, again, that is still under data. Then you start your training, model training, and model training has um, very specific steps. We have maybe split that data into two, your test set and your train set, in some cases your validation set. Then from your test, you just fit it into a predefined model again, which is where SKLearn comes in. And depending on the type of data, you choose your best model. You fit your model, which is mainly like a good way of saying you train your model with the data. That's what machine learning is. And then maybe you do some form of prediction. So depending on your prediction, if you do want this kind of data, so again, you go back, maybe this time you just did one flow from the data you had all the way to prediction and your output was not the best. So you decide, maybe I want to do some cleaning of this data. I want to process it a little bit. And you go back, again, you iterate and uh, you do some cleaning, you remove outliers, you remove missing values, and then you go back again, you train your model, you do some prediction and again, it's not the best. So again, you go back. So basically modeling is just simple. It has a few, a few steps that are just iterative. All these steps from the beginning to the end, SKLearn will come in handy. And I just wanted to introduce why we are using SKLearn because I will be going through a number of functions that SKLearn gives us. And um, so for SKLearn, as I've said, what is basically main in in modeling is fitting and predicting and predicting. Where fitting is mainly just training your model, and predicting is using this model, give it another foreign data, and then see how will your model perform. So that's what fitting and predicting means. As I've mentioned again, you can do that, and your method is not your model is not perf performing best. So you go back and do some form of pre-processing. And that's where transformers and preprocessors come in. Again, SKLearn has all the methods that can help you to do some form of transformation or preprocessing. And you do this and you realize, okay, now it's working. And I've, I've included here pipeline, something very important that uh, you'll be using on your way. Notice what we are doing is repetitive a lot. And you don't want to write a lot of code that is just the same, same process. So pipelines come in to just chain these two processes together and you just do maybe some form of pre-processing and then some form of fitting. And then here at the end I've included just model evaluation. So how do we know that our model is performing well or not? Again, SKLearn gives us an answer for that and we will get model evaluation. Then you notice you've done everything, you've cleaned your data, you've cleaned everything and your model is still performing at 70% what's going on. The models maybe need some form of hyperparameter tuning. And I will look into that word maybe a little bit later, but that's where we have something called automatic parameter searches. So just to go in detail, if you have any question again, just stop me if I'm going too fast. But uh, when we say fitting and predicting, as I had introduced, it is very direct, very basic. So we do some form of uh, get the, the data that for example, let me say, um, uh, okay, so I don't know what's an example of a machine learning problem. Oh, okay, so we have these images of cats and uh, you want anytime somebody takes a photo of a cat, maybe your program tells them, oh, that's a cat, or no, 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 that's a dog. Or uh, maybe even if it's not a dog, it's just, it's not a cat, you don't care what it is. Your problem is just that either it's a cat or it's not. So depending on the picture they've given, which is now what we call X, you do some form of prediction Y. We normally call X our features, the thing that leads to the predictions, and then Y our outcome, our label. 
So x it could be just one feature like i've said just basic and uh, multiple number of cut photos in every in every shape whatever looking at whatever direction and you're using this kind of data to train your model and then maybe your y is just a prediction of is it a cut or not so basically in this kind of situations that's where we need some form of machine learning so depending on um depending on your input data SKLearn comes help comes a lot to help with models, and uh, for this specific for this specific uh, situation, I've used a model called Random Forest Classifier. Okay, so let me just go back to where I imported everything SKLearn and go through a few of the models you might uh, be interacting with, and uh, everything SKLearn. So in SKLearn, it gives you all the models depending on your on your kind of data. So you'll find like most of the time we have these classifiers. You can see here I have random forest classifier and regressor. And classifiers mainly come when your data is categorical, like maybe it's a cut or not, just something very direct. Do It's just maybe two outcomes. It's either zero or one, it cannot be anything else, or is a cut or not. So most of the time you'll find yourself using classification models. Again, when you talk about regression problems, problems you might find yourself, your outcome can range between zero and one million. That's a very diverse number of labels. And um, so when you're, using, when you're attacking this kind of problem, you'll find yourself using a lot, a lot, a lot more regression tasks and a lot more reg regression models. So again, I did import from SKLearn and you can see we have these two form of um, of models imported. So SKLearn has many models. We have here the random forest that we have imported. We also have the, re the linear regression models, one of our very simplest model. We have a logistic regression model. We have an SGD classifier. There are so many. I think we also have like decision trees. We have so many models that SKLearn have. And uh, the one that you import will mainly be based on the kind of data you have and the kind of problem you're trying to tackle. So that's just for models. And uh, when, you, when you're doing a basic, a basic uh, importation of um, an SKLearn model and you want to use it, it's usually as simple as just call that model and uh, maybe set a few parameters. But in most of the time, you don't need to set any parameter. There are those parameters that have already been predefined. And when you call maybe just a random forest classifier, you're just calling it with all its predefined parameters. So most of the time, you don't need to set. So again, you've seen there are some, you can see N estimators here, maybe criterion, maximum depth. All these are parameters that can help you to make your model better. But when you just say random classifier, you'll take them as they are with 100 estimators, maybe with um, with uh, random states being none, maybe with, uh, I don't know, class weight being none. So you're just taking it with its predefined parameters. And again, what I just said, you train your model, you fit, where you give it your, your all the pictures, the input of your cut, and whether it's a cut or not. So you train your model. And then after training your model, you simply do a prediction and the prediction gives you an output so in our case we had zero or one and it gives you an output depending on your inputs so yeah so i don't know if up to there we've understood because it should get a little bit more uh detailed up to there are we together just any confirmation that we are together up to that because it's about to get deep again so just Anyone to confirm if we are still together? Okay, Sene, thank you for the confirmation. Okay. So, as I've said, you could just do this. It's direct. Import a model, do some training, predict. Very direct. But you're expecting a uh, ninety-two percent that your model is working perfectly but you find oops it's only 60 percent 0.6 something and you find maybe you need to do some form of pre-processing you might find maybe your data is uh prices and your price is ranging from maybe a pencil sold at 10 whatever rand shilling dollar 
to maybe an, an electronic sold at a hundred thousand dollar shilling rand wherever you are and in some form you might find maybe this data you need to somehow normalize it somehow transform it and that's where transformers come in and again sk learn has this libraries no, 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 has these methods that can help her to do that. So like, for example, here I've just used a standard scalar and what standard scalar does maybe it's just take your data from the 10, 10 shilling of your, of your pencil to the 100,000 of your electronic and just scales it maybe between negative one and one. Everything is just, everything is maybe normally, normally standardized into values between negative one and one. So this is easier for your model to understand because again, it's a machine. It needs values that it can understand. So we have examples there like standard standard scalar. And as you can see here, I've done some form of standard scaling and uh, you can see the output, everything is just between negative one and one. Okay, so I hope you've understood that's why we I'm just mentioning it because this is another thing you'll be using a lot from SKLearn. Something else we'll be using a lot from SKLearn is pipelines. And what pipelines are, you might find that most of the time you are doing some form of scaling. And then after scaling, you do some form of training and then some form of prediction. So the steps are very, very same, similar. You don't have to do them every time. Have a lot of code. We have standard scalar here. We have prediction here. So pipelines, again, SKLearn gives us this thing called pipelines. And you just import this method called make pipeline and you give it all the steps you want. So in this case, I'm just giving it a standard scalar and a logistic regression, another model. I hope you are following. So in what it means is anytime I call this pipeline, my data will be going through some form of standard scaling and then being fitted into a logistic regression model trained and then then i will get some form of um prediction afterwards so this can be so many things you could maybe want your code to, to maybe you are, do, you are dealing with categorical data and also dealing with the numerical data and maybe you first want your categorical data to be numerical so you do some form of one hot encoding maybe you want then after one hot encoding you do standard scaling after standard scaling min max scaling so everything you need to do, you can fit it into a pipeline so that your data can just go through that process as one. So that's where pipelines really come in handy. And you just do it in one form of uh, definition and you call your, you get your data, do a fitting. So again, here I've done pipe.fit. So when I say pipe, it's just calling here, doing a standard scaling and a logistic regression and then training my model and then I have an output. So my data has gone through these two steps. Then I can finally do a prediction, which is what is down here. So again, I am talking a lot. What SKLearn also helps us with is uh, how do we evaluate, how do we value our model? And the, most of the time we maybe look at maybe the accuracy score of that model. Maybe we look at the, maybe the precision score of that model. And again, SKLearn, this library, they have SKLearn dot, I think it's called um, uh, model evaluation or something. Let me just confirm from the importations. Yeah, no, 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 no. Metrics. We have SKLearn dot metrics, which helps us with all maybe valuing our, pro, our models. So here I've just used an accuracy score but you will find that as time goes by, you'll be inter integrating with others like confusion metrics, precisions, recalls, so many things that SKLearn gives us. And that's why here when I call my prediction model and I value it and get its accuracy score, I'm just getting a score, where is it? I'm getting a score of 0 0.97. So maybe if I was doing a model for real, this is a very nice score. This is 97% accurate. Maybe my data was two feet or I don't know, but I'm getting an 87% score and this is really, really nice. So again, going deeper into SKLearn, you might need to some point to do some form of model evaluation. And what model evaluation is, 
uh, sometimes you might find that this my 0.97 percent, no, 0.9787 score is too perfect, and maybe it's because our data has overfitted. I hope you understand this word. Maybe our data is too. It's maybe it's performing well because it has seen this data before. That's what we call overfitting. And what evaluation does is instead of just splitting our data into a train set and a test set, we do some form of uh, evaluation. So maybe our data, we split it into sections, into five. Here we do something called five folds. And maybe you're doing five, one, two, three, four, five sections. And you train on the first, or you train on the first section and you test with the rest. Then you train on the second and you test with the rest. So this in a way improve, improves uh, our functional, the functionality of our models. And again, this is something that SKLearn comes in and they have this cross validate method again already predefined. So you don't have to do the nitty gritty of doing the code again. SKLearn does that for you. And finally, as I finish on SKLearn, uh, we have I've written here as parameter searches. But sometimes we have said you'll find that your model is performing at 80% and you want, you've been, you've been told by your employer, we want a 90% perfect model. So it's still 80%. You've done all forms of preprocessing, of preprocessing. You've done everything you think and still your method is, uh, your model is working at 80%. And finally you want your model to be at 90% and you realize, oh, okay, so that random random classifier that I used, I can actually change its, um, I can actually change, I can actually change its parameters. I had mentioned parameters like maybe estimators, the maximum depth, and that's where parameter searches come. So again, SKLearn, it gives us, uh, for example, this uh, method called randomized search CV, and it goes through all the parameters in your model, like the estimators, the number of iterations, the random states it goes through all the parameters they're using in your model and tells you you know what for this specific model the estimators affect the performance very much so because of SKLearn we can actually get to know that um, maybe the maximum depth and the estimators are the ones that really affect our model and because of that we can now tune our model hyperparameter tuning as I mentioned and maybe you tweak this maximum depth Maybe you give it 10, these estimators you give it maybe 7. Then you run the model again and see does it perform better. Then you just tweak until you find that your model is working perfectly. Okay, so Prince, I see you had a question. Hi. Yeah, my, my question was that uh, is there a difference between uh, train test splits and then cross validation? Yes. So I forgot to mention train test splits. Thanks, uh, Prince, which is another method given to us by SKLearn. And in some areas, you might find that you are given two data sets. Like, for example, if you are competing in a competition, maybe with Kegel, they tend to give you a train set and a test set. That is perfect. But you're doing this learning on your own and you only have one data set, yet you want to do some form of training and do some form of testing. SKLearn can help you with that. They have this method called train test split, as Prince has mentioned. And you just say train test split. Uh, let me maybe I show you an example of where I've used it. It's um, here. And you say, I want an X train, which is now our features that we'll use to train. We want the features that we will use for testing. We'll want our labels, again, that we'll use for training, and the labels that we'll use to compare how our model will perform. So you just, this is what I want. You would say train test split and give it your data in form of X and Y. And voila, voila, I mean, SKLearn does that for you. Now you have four data sets from just, from just one thing. You have everything train test and split. So to answer Prince, what train test split does, it just splits your data into two, into two sections, a train set, and a test set, just two. But when we go to cross-validate, cross-validate is mainly focused on validation of your data. If we are using maybe 20% of your data to train, the other 80% will be used 
like okay let me say when you use cross validate is uh mm, i know maybe, maybe prints but i know you know when you do a train test kind of split it's mainly done as 80 percent and 20 percent so we use 80 percent to train our model and 20 percent we reserve to test our model later so this 80 percent is further split into other small sections but if we do split them a lot we'll have smaller data and it might not be helpful so this 80 percent that we use for training this is where cross validation comes and the, we can say this 80 percent will split into five folds again which is this is a common it's a it's set to five the cross validate takes a split of just five folds i think um We'll just see somewhere it's usually a split of uh, five folds so if you don't change it it will just split your 80 percent into five and use the first section to train use the rest to test use the second section to train and the rest to test so it's kind of trying to optimize your model to learn more while doing it in small sections when train test split just does the train on the side maybe an 80 percent split and a test split 20 percent i don't know if that's clear yes, uh, yes. yeah uh, is that to say that the cross validation would further work on the 80 percent that is going to be used to like to further improve your model or something yes. like that oh, okay perfect yes. All right that makes sense thank you yeah so you might find some tasks tell you use a five fold cross validation that means your data you are training data into five more sets you might find saying just six folds so again you change those parameters as i have been mentioning so toward Ross is asking if there are libraries that can be used for classification purposes so i'm assuming you mean a classification problem toward Ross, i'll answer as a classification problem a modeling problem toward Ross. Just um okay, so I'll just go ahead and uh, respond as a classification problem. Ah, okay, good. So if uh, if you are following with what I was saying, I said there are different types of problems depending on your data. If your data can only be, if it can only be said as uh, is a cut or not, zero or one, very simple, it's a classification problem. If the, the output varies between zero and one million, the, the range is too wide. It becomes a regression problem. For example, this week, you're doing some form of, um, of uh, understanding NLP. This is natural language. And maybe you might find yourself doing some form of topic modeling, maybe some sentiment analysis. So the kind of your model tends to change depending on the data and the output that you want. So when Teodros is asking if there's a library for these classification problems, in general, SKLAN gives you different kind of models. So like I had mentioned Teodros, when you see my imports up here, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. just, uh, I don't know what's happening. Okay, so Teodros just uh, be keen and uh, SKLearn gives you different types of models and maybe from their sub module called Ensemble, they can give you these random forest models and random forest comes maybe into different types of models. We ha they have their classifier, which is used for classification problems and they also have their regressor, which is used again for regression problems. So you might find yourself that if you say I'm having this classification problem and you realize I need a classifier, of course, then you can decide, let me use a random forest classifier, which is a tree-based a tree based kind of uh, model. The, here we also have linear regression, but I know for sure that there's definitely a linear classifier. It has to be, let me just see from SKLearn, SKLearn dot linear model imports a uh, linear classifier I hope it's there I'm, I'm just hoping it's there but if it trans it's there 
I forgot this this notebook is taking forever to load. But I do think that is a linear classifier. Let me just check. Do we have linear classifiers? Linear classifier. Yeah. So I do think there's a linear classifier. Let me ask uh, SKLAN. SKLAN. Linear models. Here we have a regression, another regression. Okay, so they're not giving me explicitly, but I think there, there should be a linear classifier. So again, when you're asking about Python library, SKLAN gives you a variety of models. It's a classification problem, it will give you a classifier. If it's a regression problem, it will give you a regressor kind of um, model. You also notice that, uh, where is it? You also notice that maybe this week you'll be doing some form of topic modeling or sentiment analysis. And again, SKLAN gives you like this model called latent, dirty, whatever allocation and this is a model that is used specifically for like nlp purposes like topic modeling so i want to go deeper into this this session specifically for modeling on type of data that you have this week topic modeling and this we you it will actually go deeper from tomorrow you get to understand modeling in terms of uh, like twitter data so i won't mention a lot about this but again sklearn gives you all types of models to address you don't have to worry if you if you don't, I think there are other models that are not in SKLAN and they are widely used. Like for example, an XGBoost, it's used a lot, and I don't think it's part of SKLAN. So you might find that something you see it's used a lot, and you wonder what's this. If it's not in SKLAN, maybe it, it has its own form of library that has been defined somewhere else. I hope that's clear to you. Okay, so Kishahoni also has another question and is asking, as we know, there are three types of data splitting, train test split, train test validation, and cross validation, yes. But I don't get the reason why we use validation part in train test validation and when it is, when it is necessary. Okay, so get a hint. When we do a train test and validation split, uh, it's just like doing a train test split. Then you split your data into two, maybe 80 and 20 train test. But in some cases, the, which is why we said we need cross validation. Instead of using cross validation, you might decide to just split your data into three, which is the train data set, the test data set, and the validation data set. So you split your data into three. So when this is necessary is maybe if you have a lot of data and you have like 1 million rows in your data. So in such kind of data, if you split it into three, it won't really affect your train set a lot. So maybe you do uh, maybe a 70, 20, 10 kind of split where 10 is the validation is the validation section. So if your data is a lot, you can well go ahead and do a train test validation split. But if you have limited that limited data, if you do three times, if you split the data into three, you might affect the data that needs to be used for training. And that is why actually cross validation comes in. Instead of splitting your data into three, you still get to do some form of validation without affecting the amount of data you're using to train your data, to train your model. Sorry. Is that clear? Get a hand. Get a hand. Get a hand. Okay, so as Gitahin answers, I had seen a hand raised by, was it a snake? Did I read that right? As, is it a snake? Let me just, yes, a snake, a yellow. You had your hand up. Do you have any questions? Okay, I'll assume that silence means no, but just uh, again, yes, there you are. Asnake, go ahead, if you can hear me. Asnake, I, or is that a snake? Maybe I'm saying it wrong. 
Ayele. Uh, sorry, that is the mistake. Sorry? Are you raising your hand by mistake? Uh, sorry, the, that's the mistake. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. That's uh, understandable. Okay, so guys, we've gone into so much details about SK Learn and what there is to learn about personal libraries. There's not so much time left. I'll just rush through the other so that we can wrap up in less than three, three minutes. So you also notice what this tutorial was to entail is modeling and deployment. I've gone into details about modeling. I hope by now you understand. And uh, for this week, the type of modeling we'll be using is a topic modeling. And uh, topic modeling is just understanding maybe, for example, this week our topic is mainly on the China, Taiwan, and um, USA communications that are going on. And so when we have this data from Twitter and we want to understand what is going on, you'll find that that's when we do a form of kind of uh, topic modeling, where we discover the topics from those tweets. When we say sentiment analysis, which is another form of modeling, this is just understanding what is the general feeling, what's the general feeling of these tweets. And this is defined maybe by the words for say, is it a positive feeling, is it a negative feeling? And that's where most of you guys are seeing uh, like the polarity and subjectivity, um, uh, should I say variables? No, it's not variables, but let me use variables. The polarity and subjectivity is just to understand what is the sentiment in these tweets. So I've just mentioned this, but tomorrow we'll go into details about how we can do a topic model and how we can do a sentiment analysis. The other thing I just wanted to mention a little bit is on deployment. And uh, in every machine learning kind of problem or modeling problem, our idea or our goal is to get our data to this uh, client, this employer. And most of the employers will meet out there, the people who don't, who, don't, who don't understand anything technical. And that's why we have, uh, they don't understand anything technical, and maybe they are uh, scattered all over the place. And that's where we have form of deployment coming in. You want your data, the model you've used, you want somebody who is maybe a CEO to use it without seeing the back end of what is going on. And so you just deploy your model in a platform that they can uh, get to interact with and use your model without knowing what is going on behind. It's an, again another form of abstraction, like a digit uh, said. As we are using Python, no, 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 Pandas, Scala, and Matplotlib. So this people in business get to use your code, your model, your program to run something. And uh, in form of deployments, you'll find yourself interacting with applications like Flask and Streamlit, Heroku, some cases. And uh, again, I won't go into the nitty gritty of this because we will cover a form of deployment on Friday. We'll go uh, deep into Streamlit because we'll be using this again a lot during during our, our 12 week program. Okay, so that wraps up the Python libraries. And um, again, I've not gone through EDA. I clearly didn't time myself. But what EDA is, as I had introduced, is just exploring your data, understanding your data. Is there something missing from your data? Is there something that does not make sense? Maybe if it's numbers and you see that most of your numbers are um, between zero and 10, and then suddenly there's a number that is one million. Definitely maybe somebody did a human error and that should just not exist in your data because it will make your model not work nicely. So that's what exploratory data analysis means. And to do this, we can explore the statistics, again, given by libraries like pandas, numpy, and um, yeah, we can explore the statistics or we can explore them visually. And then visually now it's where the match plot clip comes in. So this notebook has also been provided for you. I'm really sorry there's an error somewhere here. I wasn't able to solve it. I live with an error somewhere here. And this notebook is shared with you. You can just uh, understand how exploited analysis is done, which is again, like, if there are any nulls, you just maybe, I was doing here, maybe a way of understanding if there's any null. Pandas help us to know if there's any nulls. And you can see I have maybe 
17,000 columns which have null values. So if the data is a lot, you might find that maybe a way to impute, maybe give it whatever is occurring the most. But if the data will not affect your data sets, maybe you can just decide to drop them. And Pandas gives you a way to just drop those, those null values. Again, you might find yourself using this library. It's not, I've not introduced it explicitly, but this, val, this library called regex. And it also has other functions that can help you understand your, your data. It's important as a re. This is a regex, um, a regex um, ra, hey, hey, ra, hey. that word is, it has, it has kept my mouth. I'm sorry for that. But uh, as you can see here, I just did the help command and you can see what it is, maybe how it helps you. This is the again, it really helps you to understand things more well. So for this case, you should be using Twitter. You may find yourself using a lot more of these three libraries. Right. Okay, so another way you can you can understand that I have said is uh, using visualization. And uh, when in Matplotlib can help you with direct visualizations, like um, here we have a bar, a bar graph, and it's directly as just plot and the kind that you want is a bar graph. If you want maybe a scatter plot, you can just do plot kind scatter, or maybe if you're doing a, a pie chart, it's just kind pie chart. Again, Matplotlib, as I said, can give you all these forms of uh, visualizations to understand your data. So something else we do in, um, in kind of like Twitter data, and he did, he did, he did mention this yesterday in his tutorial, was doing the word clouds just to see how are the words spread within your tweets within your data and uh, we also have here a code that helps us to this to do this form of word cloud just to understand what's what's what it's being talked about a lot so this is also another form of uh, exploring your data just understanding what your data is about yeah. So up to there, I think that summarizes what exploratory data analysis is about. I'm sorry I couldn't go into details. I wanted us to understand the Python libraries because we'll be using them mostly. But you can go through this notebook. It's been shared. Somebody asked if you can play around with these notebooks. Yes, you can play around with these notebooks. Maybe not directly from this folder because this folder is being used by someone else. Just get the notebook to your local environment. And you can run this using Jupyter Notebook. It works perfectly. You can run it maybe with a VS Code, any IDE you're using. For me, I just chose, I chose to use Google Collab, but you can use any IDE. Play around with it. Do change this, change that. Even for those who are working with data this week, you might find a few things here that will actually help you to fix your bugs. So you can just go through and um, I just play around with these notebooks. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, there's an assignment here, and it says for practice. So I saw some people saying I'm uh, doing an assignment from Monday from Tuesday. These assignments that, that are included in the notebook, they are just to to help so that after you've gone through the notebook to get to gauge yourself, did I understand this topic well? So this is none of these are for submission. It's just to help you understand what is going on in that notebook. I hope that's clear. And up to that, I'd say I am done. If you have any questions, you can ask now. Then we can just end in a few. Did you understand what the libraries are about? Maybe if I can just ask a question before your questions come in, maybe I can ask the questions. Do you understand what pandas are about? What smartplotlib are about and SKLearn? I talked about a lot about modeling. Can maybe someone just um, give me a summary of the modeling process? before we end. Yes, that is. There's another hand. People are raising hands and lowering them. You know, I'm a quick reader. Before Prince goes ahead, I did see that maybe it was mess. Let me find you. We're going to talk next. So let me see. Was it Messeret? I think that's the name that. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? 
uh, there is a independent challenge on our uh, Google Docs. Uh, we are expected to do it uh, alone or we gonna merge it with our daily uh, challenge. So which challenge are you talking about? In which document? Uh, Someone posted on our Slack, uh, uh, bashing like that. Uh, uh, you are expected to uh, submit your daily independence challenge. Independence challenge. I, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't identify the doc slide right now, but there is some independence challenge on uh, our Google Doc. Uh, so we gonna uh, submit it uh, alone or. Uh, we merge it with our daily assignment. Uh, it is on some documents. Uh, okay. Right now. I think I've understood what you mean, Messeret. And uh, maybe if you can just mute, there's a lot of noise from your end. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think what you mean is uh, from the schedule, it says independent work or independent just working on your work independently and what this means is after this session there is no other scheduled session you can use this time up to submission time to just work on the week's challenge it's not a new challenge it's not a new assignment it's just that the week's challenge you can use this time to work on it then you do your submission by 8 p.m utc I hope that's clear okay i got it so if the submission link has not been added in G class, it is not a required submission. It's for your own just exploration. So the required submissions are the ones where the link is on G class. If you are maybe confused on what to submit, just go to G class, look at the submissions for that day, and that is exactly what is expected from you, nothing more. Okay, Prince, over to you. Um, if, if, well, what I took from the session is that um, with modeling, you have a set of data that you are going to train uh, the computer to be able to make uh, guesses as to what feedback should be uh, should be expected if certain parameters are met. So you just, uh, from the session, you made us understand that you have to divide your data into segments so that you use part of the data to train the model and then you test it's just like you quizzing somebody on a material you teach the person on a linear linear expression uh, what linear expressions and then you have tests for them to see to gauge whether what they have studied they actually understand what they have studied or not so it's the same thing with the models you split your data in such a way that you use uh, some of the data to train the machine and then you use some of the data as the remaining data to test the machine and then at the end of the day you evaluate or you would mark the machine to see how the machine has performed however in some cases you realize that the data is the the machine is able to mimic the data so well that it gives you positive results but then at the end of the day, you realize that the feedback you're getting from the machine is not as, um, will be a good word for that. It's not as uh, accurate, okay. yes, as possible. So then you have to go in, like you were explaining with the cross validation, you, uh, you run another test again, whereby it will split the already, the data that you've already fed it, to, for the training, it will split that data into various sizes again and run the test and retrain again to see the output that you will get, the results that you will get from it. And from there, you, you gauge, you'll be able to gauge whether the model you have is a good model or not. So that's my takeaway from today's lesson. Thanks. Okay, that is a nice summary, Prince, and just uh, the takeaway from all that, everything that is done in that modeling, Python libraries can help. So anything you're doing, Python libraries can help, which is um, 
the take away from this session. So without much to add, if there are no other questions, no one else feels like they need to say something, I think uh, we can end there. So maybe I'll just leave the session on for another two minutes after 5.25, 20, sorry, that is, that should be 2.25 uh, UTC, 5 p.m. UTC, then uh, we can just end the session there. If you have any questions, just reach out to me. So sorry I went overboard with the time, but I hope you did take away something from this class. Okay, we have to there. Nothing from my end. Bye. If you have no questions, you can just leave. If you have any question, you can linger on in another one minute or so. Bye, guys. Happy